This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Chapter 1 deals with what's meant by an organisation and what structures they can have. So here's a definition of uh, organisations. It's a social arrangement which pursues collective goals, which controls its own performance, and which has a boundary separating it from its environment. And a number of, of kind of key words in there to be looking at. First one, it says a social arrangement. Organizations are made of, of people, and we are social animals. We interact, we have preferences, we have uh, people in the organization we like, others maybe don't like so much. Uh, we have different personalities and so on. Uh, and this uh, recognition that there are social arrangements is very important. And early management theory uh, didn't really recognize this very well. It was very kind of uh, militaristic almost. It would uh, give orders, expect them to be uh, followed, irrespective of uh, whether you thought that was the right thing to do, or whether uh, you were overworked, or, uh, and, and so on. Didn't certainly ask you for your opinion. Later uh, theories of management uh, put much greater emphasis on this social a aspect that, that we like to be informed, we like to be asked uh, about our opinions and so on. Collective goals. So a commercial organisation, ultimately the collective goal tends to be profit, but not all organisations are commercial. Uh, charities are organisations and there the collective goals might be the alleviation of hunger, the provision of education, uh, the provision of food and, uh, and the like. Controls his own performance. Uh, yes, so we look at our own performance and we, uh, generally speaking, what you have is some sort of target or budget uh, and a well-managed organisation will keep under review how well it is proceeding towards that target and it will modify what it does, if necessary, to try and achieve the target. And it has a boundary separating the organization from the environment. We know who is in the organization, we know who is outside the organization, uh, we know uh, whom we can give uh, orders to, uh, and who we can't give orders to, and, and the like. So this business of the environment, this comes from a, a, a bit of theory called systems theory. We didn't go into it very much. Uh, but systems theory uh, sees that you have the organization, then there is, around the organization, there is a, a, a boundary separating it from the environment. And generally speaking, there's input that goes into the organization and output that comes out. So if it was a manufacturing company, you have the, the factory, if you like, in here, you have the suppliers, the customers, the government, and so on outside. And the manufacturing organization would take in raw materials, input, and indeed energy from energy suppliers. It would process them within the organization, manufacture goods, and these then would be distributed uh, to customers. Why is this important? Well, uh, it's important uh, uh, in a way to know who's within the organization, who isn't within the organization. Uh, and furthermore, the whole organization then tends to be broken into little subsystems. So within uh, the manufacturing organization, you would have uh, part of it which deals with purchasing, the purchase of raw materials, part of it which deals with manufacturing, part of it which deals with sales, you know, another subsystem which deals with accounting, maybe another subsystem which deals with IT and so on. And all of these have their own inputs and outputs. And it's important to know where the, the boundary is, uh, because uh, when it comes to ordering more stock, more raw materials, who should do it? Should it be somebody who's in the, the stores, in the inventory, who sees the levels going down? Or should it be someone in manufacturing who sees we've got all of these sort of orders coming in, we need to place an order for raw material? It maybe doesn't matter who does it, but it's important that we know uh, which person has that responsibility. In theory, there are certain systems 
which do not interact with their environment. There's no inputs, no outputs. Uh, uh, they, they would ignore what customers want, for example. Uh, uh, and by and large, these organizations have no long life. Uh, they're more of a, a, a theoretical curiosity. Organizations which do interact with their environment take input in, produce output. Those are known as open organizations. The ones which do not interact with their environment, in other words, a temporary type of organizations, are known as closed. Types of organization, you can have uh, commercial, they could be sole traders, a person starting on their own. Partnerships, where several people work together with a view to profit. Limited liabilities partnerships, limited companies. Great thing about limited liabilities partnerships and limited companies is if the, 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 the company goes bust, uh, then the uh, creditors of the company, the people owed, owed money by the company, cannot come after the uh, the shareholders, if you like, for personal assets. So the liability of shareholders is limited, and in limited liability partnerships, the liability of the partnership is limited, the liability of the businesses is not. You can have not-for-profit organizations, like, for example, charities. They have some other goal other than profit-seeking. Public sector organizations are owned either by the government or local government, central government or local government. Very often they're not for profit. Health services, uh, the uh, defense industry or the uh, the army, if you like, is not a profit-seeking organization. But sometimes they are. Sometimes uh, in, in some economies the public sector owns, let's say, airlines or bits of the car industry. These are nationalized industries. Uh, and that they would generally be expected to make profit, uh, though often in a public sector context they did not. You can have non-governmental uh, organizations uh, like Greenpeace. So they're not run by government, they may be sponsored by government, they may get money from government, but technically they are independent. And then there's cooperatives, this is a bunch of people working together uh, cooperating in some enterprise, uh, uh, generally sharing the uh, the profits at the end of the period. So here are the organizational structures. First of all, we have got entrepreneurial. An entrepreneurial is a very uh, uh, simple organization. An entrepreneur is someone who starts a business. So we're looking here at a relatively young business and a relatively small business. Uh, and, and really what you have in an entrepreneurial structure is, is the boss and uh, maybe a couple of workers. But there's no complicated structure. It simply isn't big enough to have that. It simply hasn't evolved towards that. Functional structure is very, very uh, common. Uh, typically what you have in a functional structure is you have the, the CEO. Let's put the CEO here, the chief executive officer here. And then you have the board. So here we have uh, uh, maybe the, uh, the finance director. Here we maybe have the manufacturing person. Here we have maybe uh, sales and marketing. Here we have maybe IT. There may be some other ones in there as well. And then under the finance director, maybe it splits into a management accounting and financial accounting. And then kind of below that, you have, you know, chief accountant, assistant accountant, somebody in charge of the receivables, somebody in charge of the payables, and so on. In sales and marketing, maybe it's split in, in, in some way into uh, marketing to major uh, types of product which they have, and so on. But the essential thing is that you are grouping together people who carry out if you like, related or similar or indeed identical functions. And it's very efficient. Uh, you get great economies of scale. All the accounting goes through the accounting department and so on. You can get great expertise uh, within that. And it's a terribly, terribly common way uh, to uh, structure organizations. And in your, your notes, it has there a list of the major functions within organizations like ordering and purchasing, manufacturing, production, 
Uh, if you're not producing uh, instead of manufacturing, you may be in direct service provision. Uh, so a firm of accountants does not manufacture, but it, it, it provides accounting services. Sales and marketing, that's finding customers, finding what they want and then selling to them. Distribution, we might have our own fleet of lorries and vans and look after it ourselves. General admin, record keeping and uh, so on. Research and development, human resources, looking after the recruitment, training, retention, uh, appraisal uh, and the like of your people, your employees. Accounting and finance. Uh, we have got uh, also in some larger organizations, we have a specialist department looking after in particular cash. Uh, and it can be sometimes called a cashier's department, making sure the cash flow is okay. Or what we might have is actually a treasury department. And the treasury department looks after, if you like, the, the big things surrounding f uh, uh, funding. Uh, do we need to go to the bank and negotiate a loan for September? How are we going to deal with this large amount of dollars, which is going to be coming in in three months? Uh, how are we going to you know, deal with the exchange rate fluctuations and, and the like? So the uh, functional organization is very, very common. Now, what I'll do uh, just before we get on to matrix and boundary lists and, and so on here, let's just look at the divisional structure here. What a divisional structure says is we're now so big, we're operating in North America, we're operating in Europe, we're operating in Asia. We're, we're really dealing with different competitors in those three markets. We may be, may be making slightly different products. There are different laws and rules and regulations in those three markets. Does it really make sense to have only one sales and marketing department or only one manufacturing department? And what the divisional uh, organizations do uh, is they would say, well, here's our American division, here's our European division, here's our Asian division. Uh, within that, uh, you know, we would have purchasing, we'd have manufacturing, we'd have sales and so on uh, going through. So there's a certain duplication going on. Uh, we now have, you know, several manufacturing plants, several sales and marketing, several kind of purchasing departments. But the idea is that you get specialism. You have people who know in the sales department, they know exactly what the US customers want and what sort of competition there is. In the European division, uh, we know exactly what those customers want and, and, and so on. Here we've divided it up in terms of geography. It doesn't have to be in terms of geography. You can also divide it up in terms of major product uh, categories. So in the UK, we had a, a major chemical company and it made agricultural chemicals, basically fertilizers, and it made paint. Now, there's really hardly any overlap on those skills or on those customers. So they had their agrochemicals division and they had their paint division uh, and they became specialists in, in that. Matrix organization, slightly different. Uh, we just draw one here. Matrix organization, a good way of thinking of it is you've got project A, project B, and project C. In each of these, you've got a project manager who's responsible for bringing in the project on time into budget. And then we have a, a number of functional people across here. We may be have engineering, we have maybe manufacturing, maybe we have quality control, and so on. So we've got project teams made up of a, a, a mixture of skills, people from each of these disciplines. And what we have, for example, is a quality control person who's working at the minute on project B and who reports to the quality control manager. So this sets out a kind of two-dimensional matrix rather than uh, just going down within one department all the time. And this recognizes that this person has got dual responsibilities. Responsibility to the Project B manager to make sure they want to help the project coming in on time and to the right quality. And a 
kind of technical responsibility to quality control to make sure that the the building, the production, whatever it is, is of the right quality. Now, classically, this was regarded as being a bad setup to have, in a way, to be responsible to two bosses, to potentially two people shouting at you, and maybe sh trying to pull you in different directions. The project B manager says, speed it all up. We need to get it finished in time. The quality control manager says, now take your time, do the quality control checks properly. And this is putting this poor employee under this great tension between two managers. Myself, I think this uh, depiction of what's happening, the matrix organization, is honest. Uh, and what it allows this person to do is say, look, look at the matrix. I'm responsible to you and to you. If there's a problem in getting the project completed on time because the quality control tests are going to take too long, why don't you two managers sort it out? You're the, the ones who are more senior with the most skills. But don't shout at me. Don't expect me, in a way, to make my decision on the basis of uh, the, the manager I fear most or who shouts louder. That's not any good way uh, to make a decision. So matrix organisations are supposed to uh, emphasize kind of cooperation uh, uh, between different, I suppose, requirements, different targets within the organization, uh, and should uh, allow it to be sorted out any tensions at a higher level. Boundaryless, virtual, hollow, modular, these are more modern types of uh, organization. They're all covered in the notes. I'll just talk about virtual uh, here. So uh, some IT companies, for example, Apple uh, doesn't make its own phones. Uh, Apple is fantastic at design and fantastic at developing technology, but, but to some extent then, then clipping these bits and pieces together to make a, an iPhone is not something which adds value particularly. It's a very repetitive you know, say it's a low skill task, is pushing it a bit, but it's, but it's not it's not a clever task. Uh, so what Apple does is says, right, we will maintain the elements which give us our edge, the design and development, and we will subcontract the manufacturing, and we will subcontract the the, the distribution to a company, logistics company like DHL or TNT or something or UPS, something of that sort. So what virtual companies do is they, they reduce themselves down to where they have real, genuine expertise and everything else tends to be subcontracted. Everything else, to some extent, is a necessary evil, uh, but it's not clever and we just want to give it to uh, uh, people who are going to do it very well and very efficiently. Uh, and, and so we maybe subcontract manufacturing to a huge manufacturing organization which is based somewhere where labor costs are low. Levels within organizations, strategic. Strategic is really the board. Uh, think of every time you see the word strategic, think of about five years. These people should be taking a kind of long-term view. Where is the organization going to be in five years? What's it going to be up to? What's it going to be doing? What sort of technology is it going to be in? Operational is basically day-to-day. -day. These are people who do the work, who record the sales, who, who record the dispatch, who record the goods coming in and so on. Think of that as the, who, who get on the phone to a customer and try and sell them stuff. This is an operational level. It's day-to-day -day activities. And then uh, we have, I shouldn't say technical, we should actually say tactical. Tactical level, not the tactical level, the tactical level. Think of this as about one year. So strategy and tactics. Strategy is long term, tactics is shorter. Think of this as a manager uh, who is concerned with making their budget. And usually the budget will be you know, the year's results and so on. They are concerned with controlling the costs and the sales and so on within a relatively short period. But they're not going to be making big changes. That's for the strategic level. 
Recent uh, uh, kind of changes we can look at now uh, uh, a little bit, uh, and indeed the shape of organisations. So a tall, narrow, wide, flat. So a tall, narrow organisation, you've got many, many layers, hence tall and narrow. What we have in this very regular organisation is every manager looks after two people. That's known as a span of control. So every manager is looking after two people. The wide flat, it's got many fewer layers, uh, but the span of control, well here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Span of control is the number of people reporting directly to you. Here the span of control was two. There has been generally a movement that way. And the movement that way for two reasons. Uh, first of all, if you're looking after two people, uh, it gives you an awful lot of opportunity to always redo their tasks. Uh, and there's a lot of checking up on people which is maybe not actually needed. Close supervision is possible, therefore you do it to keep your job. And people began to think, well, where's the value added in this? We've got senior managers, supervising managers, supervising senior supervisors, supervising supervisors, supervising assistant supervisors and so on. All of this kind of duplication and wasted effort, it's costing huge amounts of money, which is, is really not justified. So let's get rid of these middle managers and save money. The other reason it's moved this way is that change was very difficult in tall narrow. By and large, all these layers have their own little perks, you know. What, what, what sort of car you got, what sort of holidays you got, uh, maybe you, whether or not you got into a, 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 you know, a certain canteen within the organisation, what sort of holidays you got, what sort of health care you got. They all came attached with their little perks, basically, and people were very defensive about them. Uh, and that made shifting and changing the organisation, people would dig their heels in to reserve what they had. It also meant that communication up and down the organization uh, was jeopardized because uh, you tell your manager, they would have to interpret what you said and pass it on to the next manager and so on. Uh, a bit like, you know, the game you played as a child when you stood in a circle, you whisper something into this person's ear that goes around, comes out completely different than the other side. Uh, and uh, with increasing speed of technological development it could be the new person at the bottom who knows stuff let's say about social media about twitter facebook instagram and so on that maybe the uh, traditional chief executive officer a much older person would not know about and there should be much better communication horizontally or very and vertically and again uh, here with fewer layers the uh, communication is much better, much more reliable, uh, and also the, it, it, it's suggesting teamwork. You're, you're all much more egalitarian in a single layer, so shifting responsibilities around, forming teams, disbanding teams, reforming teams, and so on, should be much easier so you can respond quickly to market developments and technical developments and so on. Centralization and decentralization uh, shows where power lies in the organization. If something is not decentralized at all, it strictly means the person at the top looks after every decision, both important and trivial. And the, important, the, the, the problem is that they will not have time to do that properly. Uh, so, so, so decisions will be delayed. They may not have the expertise. Why should a single person at the top be able to make decisions about IT and about advertising? It, it, it's not very motivating for other people if you can never make any decision yourself. And if you never make any decisions yourself, how are they going to decide whether you're any good or not if you're just following instructions? 
So some decentralization is good. Faster, better decisions, more motivating for staff, and so on. The potential danger is poor coordination. One person makes a decision, uh, good for their department perhaps, but which is, is, is harmful to another department. Uh, so, so some sort of overview really needs to be uh, kept within decentralized organizations. Recent trends, downsizing just means getting smaller. Delayering, that's going from tall, narrow to wide, flat. Outsourcing, that's like the virtual organization where you get other people to do certain aspects of the manufacturing to you. Offshoring means going abroad. Either move your factory abroad or outsource to people who are abroad, uh, where, where it may be uh, uh, cheaper or maybe better. Shared services uh, is where if you had, let's say, a, a firm of lawyers, let's say they were in six major cities, instead of each of the offices having its own billing department and invoicing department, you say, right, we're going to have the accounting department in city one, and everybody else sends in the information to that uh, centralized accounting department, and all six offices share the expertise, uh, the services provided by that central department. And finally, we have formal and informal organizations. Uh, formal stuff is basically what's written down. So the organization chart, probably written down. Procedures manuals, written down. A mission statement, kind of saying what the organization is for, what its values are, written down. Staff appraisals, written down. Uh, your, uh, 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 training record written down and so on. This is all the stuff management knows about and management causes or is responsible. However, the idea came that uh, there's a lot of other stuff going on within organizations that uh, management is not in control of and management might not even know about. And this diagram uh, it represents an iceberg. And you, you know in an iceberg that the majority and the dangerous part is the bit that you can't see is hidden on the water. And similarly, down here we have all the informal parts. Like uh, uh, alliances, people that you are friendly with. So no matter, no matter what management says, you're friendly with this person, maybe you, you, you tell them information you shouldn't. Uh, there's rumour and gossip terribly powerful, you know, the chat around the, the coffee machine uh, and so on. Pe people often get the, the wrong end of the stick entirely and get worried about job losses where maybe they're not talked about. A group norm, kind of informal agreement about, say, how hard you should work. And if you begin to break a group norm, if you, you know, most of your colleagues are making 20 items a week, and you manage to make 30 items a week, they're probably not going to like you. And, and there's a lot of pressure on people to not rock the boat, if you like, to, to behave in a generally accepted way, which can be very resistant to management efforts to, to change it. Uh, there may be personal ambitions. So you may be in the accounting department, but maybe you would uh, kind of quite like to have a go maybe in sales and marketing, you know, something radically different uh, but, but during the staff appraisal maybe you, you 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 feel that that's being cut off in some way and if you feel your personal ambitions are not going to be met in one organization maybe what you do is to move to another organization uh, and, and 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 that may well impoverish uh, your old employer